Well, perhaps you've heard this story before. It is a story about a mother who was invited by her uh, son over to his apartment after dinner. And his son lived with a, uh, had a, had a female uh, roommate that he lived with. And the mother was a little bit skeptical or suspicious that something was going on between the two of them. And over the course of the meal, the mother would look at this uh, young woman and couldn't help but notice just how pretty she was. And she'd long been suspicious that there was something going on, but she wasn't quite sure. But over the course of that dinner, she kept noticing the little glances that the two would uh, steal each, uh, each other and give to each other. And just in the way that they interacted, and she just thought, there is something going on here. And as if her son could read her mind, he interjected and said, Mom, I know what you must be thinking, but I can assure you we're, we're just roommates. We're just friends. Well, about a week later, his roommate came up to him and said, You know, ever since your mother came to dinner, I've been unable to find the silver plate. You don't suppose she took it, do you? He said, Well, I, I doubt it, but I guess I can email her and, and just to be sure. And so he sat down and he wrote the following email. He says, Dear Mother, I'm not saying that you did take the silver plate from my house. I'm not saying that you did not take the silver plate. But the fact remains that it has been missing ever since you were here for dinner. Love, your son. Well, several days passed before he received an email from his mother, which read the, as follows. Dear son, I'm not saying that you do sleep with your roommate, and I'm not saying that you do not sleep with her. But the fact remains that if she was sleeping in her own bed, she would have found the silver plate by now under the pillow. <laughs> Love, as always, Mom. <laughs> the moral of the story, of course, is you never underestimate the intuition of a mother. <laughs> Mama knows, as, as some say. Well, there is a very special uh, relationship between a mother and a son, and I know that Father's Day is just around the corner, but I thought with today's readings, I'd start with a story about mothers and sons. Because these stories we hear about in our scripture today are about mothers and their sons. They're stories that have remarkable parallels. Now, not only are these stories about two widows, but these are widows, these are women who are living outside of Israel. They're living in the area, but they are not a part of the Jewish community. They are outsiders. Seemingly people who wouldn't be on God's high priority list. Yet it is to these two women, these two widows, that God sends Elijah and that Jesus responds to. Now, widows in biblical times represented the most powerless group in their society. You see, they lived in a very patriarchal culture, and a woman's economic situation at that time was tied to the male of the household. Without a male in the household, she really had no means to sustain herself. Now, the women in today's stories had not only lost their husbands, but now they'd also, we read, that they lost their sons. They lost their only remaining hope, their only remaining means of sustenance. They lost their legacy, but more than that, they lost their precious children. But in both stories, we see that God miraculously intervenes. The widow's encounter with Elijah results in her extending hospitality to Elijah, offering him a place to reside and food and drink. And as she fulfills that social contract that was present at that time, and that is the need to extend hospitality to strangers, she receives a miracle as her food stores do not run out. And Elijah remains there in this, in the, at that residence for several days. But eventually the son takes ill and the scriptures say there was no breath in him or that it means that he had died. And again, we have this opportunity for a miracle. And God uses the prophet Elijah to bring this boy back to life. Now in the gospel, we find Jesus traveling with his disciples to this village Nain. And he is moved with compassion at what he sees. He finds a funeral procession marching down the street and people grieving. 
and he finds that a young man has died. And he sees the young man's mother, a widow, and he is moved with compassion for her. And he approaches the body, and he commands the young man to get up, to rise. And the crowd is amazed because that's exactly what happens. The young man sits up, risen from the dead. And the people are, sh understandably, shaken and struck and, and moved. And they cry out, a great prophet has risen among us. And I think this exclamation is really important. I think it's key to understanding this story. Many scholars have pointed out that this miracle story, this particular story in Luke's Gospel, isn't recorded in any of the other Gospels. And its parallels are so uh, striking to the story we heard about Elijah today that many scholars are skeptical as to its historicity. That is, they believe that Luke, the author, inserted the story into his narrative. Now, I don't pretend to be... Uh, a crackerjack biblical scholar, and, uh, and I don't really want to venture into that debate too much. But I do think that it highlights an important question, maybe the most important question in this story today. And that is, why does Luke include this story in his gospel? Why is this story so important to him? And again, I think the key is that exclamation, a great prophet has risen among us. You see, Luke is making a connection, another connection, as he does earlier in the Gospels, to Jesus with the prophets, especially Elijah. Now, why would he do such a thing? Personally, I think it's because he's wanting to give his audience, his hearers, a richer sense of who Christ is and what Christ is all about. You see, even that term, that title, Christ, means the anointed one or the Messiah. And it can be kind of a loaded term, especially in Jesus' day. The Messiah was often thought to be a political uh, hero, someone who would rally the people and pr provide them with military victory as well. Someone who would be a king, a new king, a king maybe like David, a king who, yes, had a relationship with God, but... Where, where the uh, rubber hits the road, he was a king that brought military victory and established Israel as a mighty nation. And a lot of the people in Jesus' day were longing for a Messiah to come who would be like that. But you see, they, like many of us, can tend to be revisionist historians and only remembering the good things about having these kinds of kings because Israel's history is littered with wicked kings with terrible kings who mistreated people, who neglected the poor. Kings like Ahab that Elijah always fought against, who put selfish gain ahead of the good of the people. And it became the role of the prophets to call out these men, to call out these kings for their injustices, for the ways in which they have forgotten God's priorities. And they were, the prophets would remind the people that God prioritizes care for the poor and the oppressed above all else. And prophets like Elijah spoke with authority and the miracles that they performed were proof that God's favor was with them. And these miracles legitimized their prophetic office. And so Luke's miracle story here isn't just about the miracle itself, but it's about connecting Jesus' vocation with the vocation of prophets like Elijah. If the people were expecting another king type, stories like this one were strong reminders that Jesus' priority was to show compassion on those who were crushed by the weight of their society's injustices. The people marveled at this miracle, but they also didn't fully understand it. And they were also filled with fear. Why would they be filled with fear? Because Jesus could even command the dead. Because he could bring life where there was none. Because this Jesus could not be controlled. This Jesus could not be domesticated and fit into their neat little box. Because this Jesus spoke with authority. 
Because this Jesus subverted the dominant powers of this world and turned things upside down. And that makes him dangerous. To quote from Narnia, Aslan is not a tame lion. Elijah, too, the prophet, he was, he was also scary. People got nervous when he came around because he was the voice box of God. And God could see into the recesses of the human heart that he knows every thought, good or bad, that we've had. He knows those things we've done in secret and prefer to remain buried. He knows all the skeletons in our closets. He also knows the deep wounds of our souls and the burdens that we carry. See, in God's eyes, we are exposed. And that's scary. But here's the good part. God sees it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the neediness and the manipulations, the sins and the successes, and he still loves us. He is moved with compassion at the state of our lives because we can all be like the widow at times. This week's been especially difficult in our parish as two of our parishioners have become widows, saying goodbye to spouses of many, many years. I can only imagine that type of pain. But all of us can relate to the pain of loss, whether it be a loss of a relationship, perhaps those who have gone through a divorce or the ending of a close relationship or the severance of a family relationship. You know that sense of, of pain and hardship, the agony, the fear of an uncertain future. There are certain uh, similarities that we all experience in this life. Whenever we've had our hopes uh, dashed, our dreams um, crushed, there are challenges that the single parents face. Challenging of loving and nurturing a child on one's own must be overwhelming at times. You see, the widow represents all in our society and all of us who have ever lived on the margins or felt cut off from others. For those who have ever struggled to survive, who carry hurts and heartaches. But this morning, the word of God speaks to us today, to all who grieve, to all who have ever felt abandoned, to all who are poor in body or spirit, to all living with fears, regrets, doubts, and illness. The word of God speaks to us today to take heart. For the Lord looks upon his people with compassion. Our Lord is one, as the psalmist declares, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. Let us pray. Lord, you know the sorrow in all of our hearts. You know the joys and the pains. You know the love and the hate. And we thank you that you still love us. That you love us more than we can ask or imagine when you care for each one of us here today so much may we like the widows hear your voice may we hear your word that breathes life into us we pray that each one of us here today would not leave the same but would experience your life-giving presence anew and afresh this day and make us always mindful of the needs of others and how you are calling us to speak life to them. We ask this in the name of Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen.